today on What's Next. Nothing fast is going to happen with me here this morning. And if we keep using that mind, you got to oil it. And the way you oil it is to use it. Painting for him is a very mindful experience. Hello and welcome back to What's Next. I'm Mark Middleton and on our mind today is mindfulness, which is really kind of like having nothing on your mind. Uh, it's a word with a lot of buzz and a lot of research behind it that supports just how important it is for all of us, physically, mentally, and emotionally. Uh, we know that we should be more mindful, but how do we do that? And to answer that, let's bring in some of the great minds of our time. We've got Cecily Wilson, Bill Schaefer, and Amy Sweezy, and Bill, I'm almost afraid to ask because I do know how your mind works, but I'll risk it. What's on don't your worry, mind today? <laughs> you know, Mark, as one of the great minds of our time, I do appreciate you asking me that. And I, I got to admit, mindfulness has always kind of turned me off. I mean, the term is so froofy. And, and so I kind of try to wrap my head around what is it. And I, for me, mindfulness is what helps me be the person that I hope I am. I, I, I recently, I've been very, the thing that I get mad at myself about more than anything is when you hear of somebody that you know or you used to know that either has gotten sick or has passed away or something and you're, why did, how long has it been since I talked to them, since I reached out? And to me, mindfulness is coming up with ways to stay connected with people in, in ways that, that let them know that you care about them without you know, going over the top, but just keep those connections together. Mindfulness is being the best me I can be, so that's a pretty tall task. <laughs> <laughs> it, it sounds like it's how you deal with uh, guilt to some extent. Uh, Amy, I've got to ask you this because I heard that you uh, recently took one for the team. You ventured out <laughs> and you tried something new uh, as a way to try to become more mindful by connecting or maybe reconnecting with nature. You took a bath in the forest. Exactly. You know, <laughs> I was a little bit worried when I first got this assignment to go forest bathing <laughs> and I literally thought I was going to have to go sit in a tub of dirt, but that really wasn't the case. <laughs> It's actually known as Shinrin Yoku in Japanese. It originated in the 1980s in Japan to help with the country's tech burnout and also help reconnect individuals with the country's forests. And it slowly kind of made its way to the West where it's known as forest therapy, which is how the word is translated. So William Watson is a certified forest therapist. Yes, that is a thing. And he explained to me that forest therapy, it's more than just taking a walk in the woods. The whole goal is to utilize our five senses to unite us with nature. I've always had this thing about trees. I don't know where it came from. To me, they're just amazing. The concept of an oak tree coming from a little bitty acorn into this huge, massive tree, I just can't think of anything more magical. The Japanese call it an experience a process of embodiment through the senses, an immersion in the innate healing properties of the forest. Hoping to tap into the magic, I joined William and a small group of others to forest bathe. Nothing fast is gonna happen with me here this morning. It's all gonna be about slowing down, right? I've always found that that, that breathing technique really helps slow things down and gives me the tools I need to kind of focus. I want you to t consider taking an inhale, big inhale, and then at the top of that, grab a little bit more, and then just let it all out. After the breathing techniques, we began the journey to reconnect our senses with nature. So we use our sight every day, from nursing, selling cars, whatever we're doing, we use it every day. So this is a chance for you to allow it to focus naturally. What had caught my eye was just the, really the pattern, the pattern on the tree and the bark. Like, wow, that grass is like neon green. I was noticing how at the top they sway, but at the bottom they're solid. And I invite you to think about what you hear. I've got some grapes and tomatoes. I want you to think about the sensation you get when you chew it. 
Reminded me of New Year's Eve, because for New Year's Eve we um, eat 12 grapes before midnight, so. You know, smell evokes one of the strongest memories that we have. I smelled the part that's not open, and it, it's Christmas. Like, they first, like, I was shocked, and I thought, oh. Our last sense that we're going to work on is our t sense of touch. Is the texture that you're feeling, is it hard? Is it smooth? Is it brittle? Once we covered all five senses in the forest, William asked us to take one final slow walk among the trees. A ceremony of hot green tea ended our session as we shared the benefits of our time together. I would recommend forest therapy to people who think they're too busy to do it. If, you, if, you, if your answer to this is, I don't have time for that, you are exactly who needs to make time for this. So it started as a work assignment, but it really took me back to my childhood, being out in nature without any cares or concerns. So now I'll open it up to you guys as we talk about nature and mindfulness. Do you make time to connect in nature? Bill, how about we start with you? When was the last time that you took the time to be out in nature? When was the last time I cut the grass? <laughs> you know, and, and I know there are tons of benefits, but we don't slow down anymore. We don't take a deep breath. I think the, the most recent thing I did, thank you for asking, is I actually did the bird feeder thing. You know, I went to the bird feeder store and got the poles and I set up nests and a, a handful of bird feeders. And I spend more than I should every month putting in the seeds and the mealworms. And I sit at the kitchen table and look out the window <laughs> and watch the birds and I feel connected with nature. <laughs> I, and you know what, first of all, you get all the great assignments. I would have loved to been out there, right? Because I love being outside. I love being in the nature. And here's the thing that I love to do also. I love sitting by the beach, love going to the beach and just listening to the waves crash up on shore and just thinking about the things that I'm either grateful for or things that I need to do and just think about life in general. So I don't do it often enough which I should, but I do enjoy it immensely. I'm with Cecily. I loved every bit of that story. And Cecily, thank you very much. I, I was just breathing in the ocean air as I heard you describe that. Uh, you know, I do pretty well when I get out of town. My wife and I recently went climbing with both of our daughters uh, in Colorado, but, but here in Florida, I am, you know, missing in action and I'm not happy about that. You know, Florida's got so many beautiful springs and rivers and hiking trails. And honestly, I never get out and do any of that. So uh, I've got to work on it. Thank you for that story, Amy. I use my mind. If you don't use it, it'll go to waste. Welcome back. A number of years ago, Bill and I were in the office and we wondered, whatever happened to Ruth Hamilton, who was a centenarian that Bill did multiple stories on when we both worked in local news? And we decided to see if we could find out if she was still alive. And, and we did find her. Uh, at 109 years old, she was living uh, in an assisted living home and she had outlived all of her family and all of her friends and she hadn't had a visitor in years. And we literally had to wake her up and not only remind her who we were, but also who she was. But we kept visiting her because she kept coming back to life little by little. And one day I told her that my computer had a camera on it. And if she wanted to share some of her thoughts about being 109 years old, we'd share it on the internet all over the world. And Ruth was fascinated by that idea and very quickly became the world's oldest blogger. Ruth 1898, the year of her birth, became her screen name. And this is the kind of thing she did. If we keep using that mind, you gotta oil it. And the way you oil it is to use it. And I go over poems. I can recite poems that I learned in, in kindergarten, I guess. Can you recite a poem now? A poem? Yes. Well, let's see, what could I say? Oh, I, I could say it in, in Latin. Mica, mica, padre stella. Mira quinum si sambella. Splendence Emilo, Agla Wailet Gamer Kylo. That's Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. 
I said it in Latin. Mica, mica, see, twinkle, twinkle. Mica, mica, padre, stella, small star. How I wonder what you are. Up and in the sky so blue. What are you doing up there? I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, I use my mind. If you don't use it, it'll go to waste. And that's why people get senile, they call it. Because the mind has never been used. It just sits there. But you've got to work it. You've got to keep it moving. And I sure keep mine going. I love to eat and talk. <laughs> Ruth passed away just shy of her 110th birthday, and this is a photo uh, of the first and the very last time we saw her. The first time on the left, the last time on the right, and folks, I have to tell you, the change was profound, uh, all because just a couple of goofballs took the time to really connect with her. Uh, it's hard uh, to not make a difference in someone's life if you try. So I guess the question for everybody out there is, who is your Ruth? Who can you reach out to and make a difference in? Uh, and, and Bill, uh, I know you were friends with Ruth for many years. What do you most remember about her? You know, th thank you for bringing her up, Mark, and, and keeping her memory going. She she was such an incredible person. How many, have you people out there, have you seen very many interviews with 109-year-olds with personality like that? You, th they're out there. You don't see that. And Mark and I would walk into this, this uh, residence where she was, and she'd be sitting in the corner, like, just staring at the little monitor up, up, in, up in the ceiling and basically gone to the world. We would ask her questions. Mark, do you remember the time that she did one of those video blogs about Britney Spears? She was <laughs> sharp, she was engaged, she needed purpose. Even at 109, she needed a reason. She needed people to, to want to talk to her. She needed things that, that people wanted to ask her and it gave her just an enjoyable life up to the very end. She, she was remarkable. The thing that enabled us to connect with her is that you knew that she got to meet Hitler in the late 1930s. You knew that she was one of the first elected females uh, in, in New Hampshire. All of this stuff that her caregivers had no idea about so they couldn't communicate with her. We were able to bring her back because you understood who she was. You could help reintroduce her to herself. It was profound and amazing to see. The colors, the textures, the sounds of creating pull him into the moment. One of our contributors is a mindfulness expert whose name is Dorothy Bush Koch, uh, who just happens to be the only person in history who is the daughter of one U.S. president and the sister of another. And in one of our many conversations with Dot, uh, she shared how her brother took up painting after leaving office and how it became his mindfulness technique. Painting for him is a very mindful experience. And what I mean by that is the colors, the textures, the sounds of creating pull him into the moment. And using art as a meditation really means being willing to approach each painting with a beginner's mind. And that's a Buddhist expression that really means leaving our expectations behind and leaving our preconceived ideas behind about something and seeing it with fresh eyes, almost like a child would. For him, that's what painting's all about. He had a book called Portraits of Courage where he painted over 100 um, veterans, wounded warriors. And then this new book is called One Out of Many, and it's portraits and stories of immigrants, um, which will remind us of the countless ways in which America has been strengthened by the individuals um, who've come here in search of a better life. So mm -hmm. it's very cool. He paints, you know, he, he's painted, I, I'm not sure the number of immigrants, um, immigrants you, you will have heard of like Henry Kissinger and immigrants you wouldn't have heard of, but all immigrants who have come to America for a better life. And then he tells their stories and he's gotten to know each and every one of them. So it's, it's quite amazing. 
You know, it really is. Critics love his work. He's continually gotten better and better. And, and guys, as an occasional painter, I can I can relate. Painting does make you focus, uh, but it also sets you free. It's kind of a pathway to the present, to the here and now. And, you know, really almost anything can make you more mindful from chopping up, uh, you know, the vegetables for your salad, <laughs> digging in your garden. So how about you guys? Uh, anybody have an activity that's relaxing and mindful for them? I'm gonna to have to explain this. I love to sit there and watch old silent movies like from a century ago because when they're silent you can't look away, right? You have to watch and the next thing you know you've forgotten about everything around you. You're watching people from a hundred years ago and sometimes I'll look up who they were and read a little bit about their lives but they're very simple human themes and you think that everybody in this film is gone and one day I'm gonna be gone and life will, the, earth, the world will go on fine without me, so it's time to live. It's time, it's time to express ourselves. It's time to connect. It's time to get out there. And I get all that, oddly enough, from these beautiful old silent films. <laughs> okay, so I know you're going to judge me, so don't judge me right now. <laughs> this, is, this is what I love to do, and I know it probably will make no sense to anyone, but I love to just walk the mall and window shop. Not that I'm buying anything. I just love going shopping and it relaxes me for the life of me. I don't under, and I will tell you when I'm really, really stressed or if I'm really upset about something, I literally go to the mall. Not that I buy anything, but I go to the mall and if I feel like I find a really good deal, then I feel better. And I don't understand why, but that's what I like to do. <laughs> that's great. That I'm actually the complete opposite, Cecily, because I get frustrated going to the mall thinking, oh, but I can't buy that and I really want to. So my, it kind of goes to what Bill was saying about the silent movies. It's about the quiet part of things. It doesn't really matter what activity I'm doing. I could be reading, I could be walking outside, I could be taking a dirt bath uh, out in the forest but I just need to be alone. That's where I find my peace in my center. I think it's because I'm an introvert and I'm surrounded by people and I love people and I love my friends and I love my family and my job and my work and busy, busy, busy. But I need that time to just be alone doing whatever I'm doing so that I can find my center. Welcome back to What's Next, exploring the concept of mindfulness in this episode. One thing, one thing we learned is that mindfulness can be contagious, so do your part and spread it around as much as you like. You know what else really helps? Taking some time every single day, every single day, take some time to be grateful, to think about how much we really have. So on the Growing Boulder page on Facebook, we asked the question, what made you smile this week? Mona said it was getting to spend time with her daughter and grandsons for the first time in a year and a half, and a lot of the responses uh, had to do with relatives. And like Sharon's, it was seeing photos of her granddaughter getting ready to go to her prom. And for Kathy, it was seeing her recently planted backyard tree blooming like crazy. She said, for once, I didn't kill a plant. So gang, what about you? What is, what is something that made you smile this week, Amy? Well, that would be me if I hadn't killed them all because I am terrible <laughs> with growing things. So that's not me. Um, I have so many blessings in my life, so many things to smile about. It's hard to just pick one. But I'm going to go with my oldest daughter, who is a senior in high school, about to graduate. Uh, she committed to a college, and she is going to the University of Central Florida right here in Orlando. So I'm very excited about that. Congratulations. Uh, so, like you, so many, so many amazing things to smile about. Two things especially. My granddaughter, Amari Elizabeth, makes me smile every time I see her little face and little puff balls on her head. She's so super, super cute. And then my youngest daughter, Nicole, is graduating from college, Howard University. And I'm super proud because she's graduating with honors and now I am officially done. <laughs> <laughs> 
You know what makes me smile is, is learning from you guys, which I do each and every day, and I've learned multiple things about your personal life today, and, and all of it makes me smile. And you know, one of the things I hope that we all learn today is that we are actually wired for survival. And what that means is that our brain has this never-ending need to recognize and then dismiss anything that's non-threatening. So we kind of live on an autopilot that keeps us from fully experiencing the moment. We don't really see the trees, we don't really feel the breeze. You know, being mindful, I think, is, is really just turning off the autopilot that short circuits our powers of observation and prevents us from recognizing and appreciating the never-ending novelty in each and every moment. And I think the goal is to live as if each moment is unique and will never happen again, because it is and it won't. We'll see you next time. Thank <laughs> you.